Question, what is something that you know, you know that you would fail if you tried to do it right now? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait a second. Wait a second. <laughs> People are like, I'm ready for this. I've been ready for this question my whole life. Uh, is something that you know you would fail, maybe you got no talent at it, maybe you're scared. A lot of times fear prevents us from doing things, and we're just like, I'm too scared of this thing. I just know there's no way I could succeed. Okay, but like you know, you know that you would fail. For instance, I used to be scared of heights, Okay. I used to be scared of heights, and I was, like, one of those people, like, you ever been at, like, either a pool with a high dive or, like, if you've gone to, like, uh, a lake or a river or something like that, and there's, like, some cliff jumping and stuff, and there's always that one, or the blob at, at uh, it, it's, per, it's a perfect example, the blob at, at uh, what's it called, the thing that I'm in charge of, camp, and so you go to the blob, and that one person that walks up, and they're scared, and they end up being there for, like, 10 minutes, and the lifeguard is like, one, two, three, go, one, two, three, go. Like, I was that person, and I can tell you, like, to that person, it doesn't feel like it's been 10 minutes. They feel like it's been five seconds, and they're just deathly afraid, and they can't do it, and then eventually they crawl down the ladder of the blob, and, you know, they leave. You know what I'm talking about? So, like, that was me, just, like, deathly afraid, could not jump from these heights. But, like, what is something that, like, you know, if I try to do this right now, there's no chance I would fail. I want you to turn and tell somebody next to you, go. All right, let's hear some examples. What is it? Did somebody say bath? I didn't hear that, right? Nobody said that. Did they say something else? Math. That's, okay, whew. They're like, I, I haven't taken a bath my whole life, and if I tried, I know there's no chance. Like, Please, no. Every middle schooler at camp. Math. Okay. I get that. Maybe you could do two plus two, or not even that. Yeah, we'll see. Hard math. What else? Anybody else? Backflip. Okay, you're like, if I tried that right now. I'd kill myself. Anybody else? Like, something that you just know you'd fail. Pull up. <laughs> and I'm talking, like, not like you would purposely fail. Like, you could give it your all. Like, you could 100%. Like, I'm putting it all on the line. I'm like, there's no chance that I'm making this right now. Okay, pull up. Anybody else? What'd you say? Running a mile. Yeah, that's tough. Running is horrible. I've preached about that many times. Yeah. Skateboarding. Okay. Anybody else? So I'm hearing a lot of lack of talent. Maybe a couple of these is fear, like the math. What would you say? Was it a joke? Okay. Somebody else? Beating me in Gaga Ball. That is true right there. Yes, that's for everything. Huh? Dunking in basketball, same. Yeah. Well, actually, I've, if you've heard my one sermon where I did dunk, actually, so that's not true. That's, I, uh, I had some help with some chairs and stuff. but Okay, skydiving? I don't know. You just have someone push you out of the plane, and you, you do it, like... You could, you could do, we could help you with that. Okay. So now I want to ask you this, whatever it is, whatever it is that you chose, okay, and some of us are being silly, some of us are like legit, like there's no, there's no chance that I could do this. And you could probably think of something, something you're not talented in, something that we've all got some sort of fear or something going on in our life that maybe we could choose that would just be like, man, I think I would kind of be debilitated by my fear if I attempted to, to do this thing. But do you think that it is impossible absolutely impossible for you to ever succeed at whatever it is that you chose. Some of us are like, yes, yes. Is it impossible for you ever to succeed at whatever you chose? Or do you think that potentially with a little bit of practice, maybe some bravery, maybe the right motivation, it's possible that you get to a place where you could do said thing. Trying to think of some of the things. A bath. We could help you. Like, we could get you there. Math. We already started. Two plus two. You, you know, you, like, you learn the basics, and you grow from there. I can't remember what anybody else said. Gaga, but I could teach you. I'm a great coach. I could teach you. We used to, we did a, I'm not going to go, if I start talking about dodgeball, I'm going to, nope, we're going to stay focused on this. I used to be scared of heights, and I say used to be because I'm not anymore. And the way, the way that that happened, very simple. Because it just had to do with the fear. And this is the way you can get rid of most fears, actually, is you just kind of take it in, like, baby steps, right? 
So deathly afraid of like even jumping off the blob, but you start out just like at your pool, you know, just jumping in from like nothing, right? And then you find like like uh, the diving board at the campground, and it's like it's not a high diving board; it's just a normal diving board, and you just kind of like step off of it, and then you jump off of it, and then you like bounce off of it, right? And and then I went to this cliff, uh, this lake thing, and there was like kind of this little mini cliff that was going up, and and I went like five feet up, and I jumped there for like a dozen times, and eventually it's like yeah, it's not so bad, you know? And you go like a foot up, and then I go another foot up, and another foot up, and and pretty soon that day. I was at like 35 feet jumping, which is pretty scary, like pretty high. And I remember walking up there and looking out, and this was something that was like, I was, I don't know if it would have been a phobia, but like there's no way, you know, like, and I jumped. And I'm not afraid of that anymore. Now, I'm normal afraid, because if you're never afraid of like, you know, if you tried to like, if you threatened to throw me off a building, I gotta be scared, but like, but I'm not like debilitated by that fear. Or we talk about motivation. I think many times we just lack motivation. There's things that we feel like we should do or we want to do or the right thing to do, and, uh, and we just don't. And a lot of times it's just this lack of motivation to actually pursue it and do it. Easy example, maybe some of you, your, your, your mom has done this to you as well. This is a story from my, my mom. My mom did this when I was littler, my brothers and I. I'm experiencing this now with my kids, um, and we would not... We would not answer her when she called us in the house. You know, she'd, she'd yell, Brandon, and we wouldn't come, and we wouldn't, you know, do the yes, mom, whole thing. You know what I'm talking about? Which is my kids right now, completely. And, uh, and it, was, it was an issue, and she felt like it was, like, it's impossible for my kids to, like, come when I call them. It's just not happening. And so my mom got smart, and she, one morning, got us together, me and my brothers. She sat us down, and she pulled out this, this big old jar of candies. Like, it was, like, these yummy looking fruity things or whatever like that. And she said, hey, today we're playing a game. And we're like, well, you know, what game are we playing? And she said, you know, throughout the day, I'm going to call you, all right? I mean, I'm going to be in different rooms. I'm going to use different levels of volume. And if you can find me, if you can find me within like 10 seconds of when I call you, then you win and you get a candy every single time. And obviously we thought this was the best game ever. All day long, my mom would do this. She'd do it in different rooms. She'd do it at different volume levels. She'd do it while we were doing different things. And uh, got to the end of the day, and we'd nailed it every single time. Sugar overload. And uh, get to the very end of the day, and she sits us down, and she says, hey, wasn't this awesome? We're like, this was the best game ever. We should play it every day. And she says, we will play it every day, but we're not giving candy anymore. Because I know now that no matter what room in the house I'm in, or no matter what you're doing, even when you're playing games and you told me you couldn't pause it, somehow today you were able to make it to me in 10 seconds. Or even though you're watching that show and it's just, you know, like, whenever I call your name, you need to come to me and say, yes, mom, right away, because I know you can do it. Right? Ha, ah, gotcha. That, that kind of sucked after that, you know, but like, but it was a motivation thing. All of a sudden when there was like candy involved, you know, what before we couldn't do, now it was like, now it's easy, right? Now we can accomplish it. Now we can accomplish it. You can do a lot more than you realize, and sometimes all it takes is maybe just a little bit of bravery, maybe some baby steps, having the right motivation. And today, what I want to talk with you guys about, I want to spend just a few minutes here as we're together before we go play dodgeball. I love dodgeball. Dodgeball is great. If I could have gone pro in anything, it would have been dodgeball, but I'm not going to talk about dodgeball. Um, I want to talk with you guys today and encourage you in your walk with Jesus and maybe give you a little bit of motivation, some of that motivation that we're talking about. Because there's a lot of times where I think there's things that we know it's the right thing to do. We hear it week after week from our youth pastors and on Sunday at church, and yet it's still so hard for us to follow through and do it, right? It's frustrating at times to us. And, and today I want to maybe offer a little bit of motivation as we look at something that, and I, I want to I say this. I think some of you, and I want to catch this early, may incorrectly, incorrectly, as we talk about this tonight, think that I'm maybe trying to make you feel bad or feel guilty or, or something like that, and it's not. Tonight, I really want to talk about something that is life-giving, that's encouraging, that brings hope. I want to talk about the blessed hope. Some of you may recognize that term. It's, Paul uses it. I want to talk with you about Jesus returning. Now, some of you may have no clue what I'm talking about. 
you know Jesus. Maybe you didn't know he was coming back. Jesus is the guy that died on the cross, right? Uh, when Jesus, I learned this actually recently, what, that this church has a thingy that they put up, and uh, when they have their, uh, what is it, when you do your Christmas production, right? Is that what happens? They have, like, these things that attach to a fake Jesus. It's a person pretending to be Jesus. And, uh, and, and two dudes back there uh, run down with two pulley systems, the stairs on either side, and then Jesus, like, flies up into the sky, um, which is, if you're familiar with the story, after Jesus dies... For our sins, he's raised back from the dead. And then shortly thereafter, he goes up in this really cool little moment that they reenact here at the church, up into the clouds, go back up to be with the Father. You guys tracking with me? And at that point, and a lot before that, and all throughout the Bible, it says that he's coming back. So Jesus went up to be with the Father, went to prepare a way for us, he says. He actually talks about he's big in a big old house. We used to sing this song back in the day. It was called Big Old House. Uh, how many of you guys know that song? Okay, all of you? Praise God, man. Wow. Pentecost. Uh, yeah, big old house, lots and lots of room. And so, and so Jesus is doing that, but he's returning. How many of you know that? How many of you are familiar with that, that Jesus is returning? Most of the people in, in Jesus' time, in fact, the disciples that watched him go up, you know that they believed that he was going to be returning in their lifetime? They're waiting for it every single day and every generation thereafter. And here we are today, and we know that Jesus is returning. But unfortunately, I feel like, I feel like we've lost. I don't know if it's just because we look at all the generations and it didn't happen. And, and most Christians today don't operate in their lives or their prayer lives or their thinking or their perspective or worldview believing that today could be the day that Jesus returns. And so I want to read this with you guys. Matthew chapter 24, verse 36 through 44. I'm going to read this. You're going to listen. All right? If you've got your Bible, you can turn there. Matthew chapter 24, verses 36 through 44. I want to look at some of this with you guys. Right before this, uh, Jesus and, and the different ones had been talking about what we're talking about here, about like the end times, about things that are going to happen in the future. And Jesus is going to be returning and coming back. And it says this in 36, however, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen. When all the things leading up to Jesus's return and Jesus's return, when he comes back, no one knows when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Isn't that interesting? I find that interesting. It says that the angels don't even know. It says Jesus don't even know when he's coming back, which I kind of love. Youth pastors, we're kind of always like, man, when, it, when, is, when is youth camp? Like, when's that happening? Like, what's going on? Or like, when we're disorganized? Jesus, too. Jesus is like, I don't know when it's happening. But like, because then it says, only the Father knows. Dad will tell me. Dad will tell me when it's done. The angels don't know. Jesus doesn't know. There's a lot of things in the Bible. We look at Revelation that talk about the end times and things that are going to happen. And I don't necessarily know that those are there for us to try and pinpoint exact 10-year period when Jesus is coming back. Because all throughout, it, it seems to very much lead to the fact that only the Father knows. When the Son of Man returns... It will be like it was in Noah's day. How many of you know who Noah was? You know the story of Noah and the ark, right? The big boat that he made, and it flooded. Everyone tracking? If you're not, the whole world flooded. Noah built a boat, and him and his family were saved. Okay? Everybody else not. Okay. So, when the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days, before the flood... The people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. This idea that nobody knows when it's going to happen, but that Jesus will be returning. Two men will be working together in the field. One will be taken and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill. One will be taken, and the other left. So you too must keep watch, for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Understand this. 
If a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. You also must be ready all the time for the Son of Man will come when least expected. I want you to turn and tell the person next to you, I want you to answer this question. Listen to this question, okay? And think about it. I'll give you just a couple minutes to mull it over with each other. If you knew, if you somehow knew that in one week, next Saturday at 7.30, Jesus was coming back, and you have one week, what's the number one thing you'd spend your time doing? Go. Go. In one week, Jesus is returning. What do you guys think? What would you spend your week doing? Because here's the thing. Here's the thing before you answer. Okay, in one week, somehow somehow we knew Jesus is coming back in one week. We don't know that, but let's say we did somehow. When Jesus returns, all of us who know Jesus, who have a relationship with Jesus, who have made Jesus Lord of our life, we immediately were gone. I don't know how it's going to happen. Some miracle, something supernatural. It's what it was talking about there when it said, hey, one person, two people are going to be out in the field. They'll be working together. One of them, they won't know Jesus. They're going to stay. The other person knows Jesus, and they're just going to be taken. They're going to be gone. We'll go to be with Jesus. So this would be your last week. What would you spend this week doing? If you somehow knew that it was your last, what would you do? What do you think? Yeah, go ahead. What, do you, what would you do? Tell as many people as you can about him. That's kind of the obvious go-to, but a good answer. But right, I mean, it's like, what else? Does anybody else want to say something? You'd worship? Spend this week worshiping? Worship like you never have before? Yeah, what do you think? Read the Bible, man. I'm going to read the entire thing three times before he gets back. What do you, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if that's possible, but I don't know. Probably could be. What do you think? What would you spend this week doing? Walmart with a tiny mic. They got a mic in there. I don't know how legal that would be. I don't know if that's a sin or what to like hijack that puppy or what. Okay, what do you think? What would you do? You would adopt somebody. I don't think you're old enough, but it'd be called kidnapping. Wait, what did you say? Are you an adult? He's what? He's old enough? Are you sure? I don't think an 18 year old can adopt somebody. Can you? All the kids are saying yes. Adults, can somebody, it says, like, you can't rent a car until you're 25, but they give you a kid? There you go. Oh, my goodness. Laws. Crazy, huh? Somebody else? Anybody else want to add anything? Yeah, what would you do? Check myself, okay? Fancy way, but honestly, a lot of us really need to. Yeah? As much time with your family, loved ones, as you can. Yeah. Yeah, last one right here. Spend time with your pets. You love your pets? Absolutely. Yeah. Spend time with loved ones. If you, if you somehow knew, now, of course, we don't know. We don't know. 
And yet you hear the end of this verse, right, when it's talking about, it's giving the, it's even giving the example of like, because it's the example that it just gave. Like if somehow a homeowner knew, somehow somebody told him, hey, tonight at midnight, someone's coming to break into your house. But they'd be like, oh, great, cool, and like go to bed at like everything's normal. No, they'd probably be sitting there with their guns or something like that, you know, like ready, waiting, like, you know, I'm going to get, get these suckers. Like, I mean, there's like no way that they would just allow that to happen. And you're right before it gives that example, it, it, it clarifies even once again, nobody knows when it's going to happen. And yet it says this, it says you have to remain on watch. It's something that I think we have lost sometimes. And the church or as Christians that we've just become content or we struggle or we haven't checked ourselves in a while or any number of things. Death can maybe feel relevant, but I don't know how many of us think daily, this could be the day that Jesus returns. It says you got to keep watch. This is kind of a bit of a motivation issue right here, right? Like we said, like, man, if you somehow knew in a week all these things are wonderful, good things. We would draw, spend more time with Jesus and worship and in his word, and, and we'd pray. we spend time with loved ones. We'd do everything we could to tell as many people as we could. We'd be breaking laws at Walmart. We'd be like, man, every, as many people as we can because this is it. All of a sudden, the motivation scale goes up a whole lot, and things that we're currently not doing – it doesn't seem like, like it's all that important to us, and we've got friends and family, and we haven't talked to them about Jesus or invited them in a long time, right? All of a sudden, escalates. Maybe some of you even then are still like, man, a week, I just don't think there'd be enough time really to do anything. Or, so let me give you another scenario, okay? Let me give you one that maybe hits a little bit closer to home. It's a little bit of a check yourself thing. I could pick any one of you right now, any one of you, you right there. I see you. I'm just picking you randomly, okay? Like you're you're cool, bro. But you, you see what I'm talking about? And if I said to you, hey, do you, you, uh, you, go, you guys have, you have church on Wednesday? Okay, cool. I said, hey, next Wednesday, next Wednesday, if you can bring 10 friends to church, I will be there and I will give you $1 million in cash. Do you think there's any chance that you would not have 10 friends at church next week? Yeah, you could. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? And I could do that for any of us, and it's true. If somehow I was to like, and it's like, well, it's a million dollars. It's your friend's eternal soul, right? If we could do it for a million dollars, surely, surely if we knew Jesus is coming soon, I've got a week left, or he's coming today, we would do everything we could, right? I would hope everything. If we believe this is real, and we love Jesus, and we know Jesus, and we somehow knew, man, everything that we would do, and it, I feel like, all throughout God's word, get a load of this, how many times it talks about Jesus' return. What we're talking about here, that Jesus is coming soon, that he's going to be here, and that we need to be ready, that we need to be on watch, that every day it needs to be as if this is the day, that that's how we act, that's, how we, that's what we believe, that that's how we worship and read God's word, that's how we talk to people, knowing today could be the last day I have a chance to tell them about Jesus. It says in the Old Testament, there are 1,845 references to the return of Jesus. That's in the Old Testament. Not just to when Jesus is there the first time, but references to his return. Almost 2,000, almost 2,000 references to Jesus' return. And there's 17 books in the Old Testament that give this event prominence. Like it, 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 it highlights it. It elevates it. In, in the 260 chapters in the New Testament, there's about 260 chapters in the New Testament, there are 318 references, or one out of every 30 verses that speak to the return of Jesus in some way. This is such, and I'm telling you, for the, for the early church, for Paul, for the apostles, I said it earlier, they believed that within their lifetime, right, they were waiting for Jesus' return. I think it was so real for them. And you look at what they did. We read their stories. They're giants of the faith. Almost every one of the apostles died a martyr's death, right? Right? We read about it, many of them crucified, some of them stoned. They went to the ends of the earth, trying to tell as many people as they could about Jesus, doing everything they could, spent time in prison, spent time sick, spent time going on long voyages, spent time under persecution, and, and, and you see what the early church did, how it just boomed, and it changed the entire world. There's so many things that we can point back. It changed the entire world, and, and what? They believed every day 
Man, today could be the day that Jesus comes back. In fact, I believe they hoped that today is the day that Jesus comes back. They were so eager. They spent time with Jesus, right? They were looking forward to his return, and yet again, somehow over the years, it hasn't happened generously, and we get to a point eventually where I just don't know if it's even on our mind most days. We're not thinking about it. The things that we know we're supposed to do, to read our Bible, to spend time in prayer, to worship and to give everything when we, every time we have a chance in corporate worship and then just in our life as we worship, to tell people about Jesus, to love people as God's word says, it, to, it just, it, we, I, I, we're, we struggle with the motivation, I think. We don't do the things that we know, we know we got to do. The things that we know, I mean, I, I've, you guys have probably heard this before. Heard an atheist, it's, very, it's a very popular uh, person, they were an atheist, and they made this comment. They said, I'm not, I don't believe in Jesus or Christianity or any, any of that stuff, but I got to wonder, how much do you hate me? If you truly believe what you believe, that I am going to hell, how much do you have to hate me to not tell me, Right? And it's like a shocking reversal where it's like, no, I don't hate you. It's just, it's, it's hard sometimes, and it's, it's challenging, and it's, it's, it's very, it's, it, there's a lot of fear involved with, like, trying to build up the courage to tell somebody about Jesus or invite them to church, and, and it's kind of a slower process. you got to work on these things, and, and all that stuff is kind of true, but at the end of the day, what if we were to live our lives in this way, that we really believed Today could be the day Jesus comes. You know, I believe that this should be a part of your daily prayer habit, that every single day when you pray, in fact, you should pray this every morning on your way to school. How many of you guys go to school? Great. How many of you are homeschooled? Is there a lot of us? Okay, praise God, including you guys, all right? Including you guys. That every day when you leave, that you would pray. And whatever you pray, pray all your stuff, your normal stuff. And at the end of that prayer, you say, in Jesus, I pray that today would be the day. Let today be the day that you come and help me to live today out. Give me opportunities, Lord God. Give me opportunities to make it count if today's the last day. And I pray that it would be. I pray that you'd be here. And then that day, you go for everything. You steal the microphone at Walmart. Your friends at the lunch table, you see people sitting alone, that whole thing, you know. But you go and you love people enough to, to care about them and to sit with them. And to when you see that somebody's low, say, hey, can I just pray for you to invite them to stuff? To, to do all the things because you know this could be it. I think there could be something powerful and wonderful. I think we would call it and liken it to an awakening or a revival if we were to actually wake up as Christians and recognize that any day Jesus could come back. And Jesus says, you be on watch for it. You be waiting. You be ready. And you say, man, that sounds like it could be disappointing day after day. Eventually, I get to a point where I'm like, I pray this every single day, and it's never happened. I guarantee you, try it for a little bit. You get to the end of the day, and it's very surprising. You look back, and somehow you don't regret that you loved those friends. You don't regret that you prayed for that kid. You don't regret that you spent some extra time in God's word because maybe it was. You look back, and it's like, ah, oh, dang it. <sighs> spent too much time in prayer today. That never, I've never felt that. It's never happened. I'd have a lot of the opposite, right? Man, I wish that I had spent some more time, that opportunity, and I, and I saw it, and I wasn't brave enough to talk to that friend, and I know God was asking. That was literally an opportunity that God created for me, and I, and I missed it. I have a lot of those moments. I don't know about you guys. I don't know if you felt those moments. And the day I wish, man, I wish I had just been brave enough and not cared enough about being embarrassed or being stupid or whatever to just have asked them if they were doing all right or to pray for them or to tell them about Jesus. I don't think you'll ever regret it. I think you get to the end of the day and you'll be glad and you'll be looking to the next day and say, Jesus, tomorrow, let it be tomorrow. Tomorrow that you come back and give me more opportunities. Send more people my way. It's a matter of your worldview and your perspective and your motivation. These things that for some of us, man, there's some students that I look to, and at times I think it feels to them, and I hate that I even felt this as a youth pastor sometimes. It felt almost like it was even as a youth pastor. I look at them, and, and I see, man, they've never brought a friend. And, and, and it's hard for me to, to get them to wake up or to, to care. And we have all the, we'll have this event, and we'll, we'll say, invite your friends. It's going to be great. And they, you know, a lot of people don't, don't bring anybody. And I get it. It's hard, and it's, it's hard. All the, and there's a part of me that eventually starts feeling some kids like, man, it's just impossible. And I hate that because it's not true. 
no matter your personality type, whether you're introvert or whatever, we're scared. We lack motivation. You know, there's these things that are so, so vitally important. And I think that if we truly understood and we turn like, and, and we just lived this out and we believed it and we prayed for it and we genuinely yearned for and wanted God, today would be the day that you return. It would change and transform your life, change and transform the lives of those around you. Complete game changer. In Titus chapter 2, verse 13, Paul says this. This is where we get the blessed hope ideology. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This idea that Paul said, he called it the blessed hope. That's what it is. This is hope. Again, today, tonight was not about making you feel bad or feel guilty that you're not doing enough. It's to give you some encouragement to put some hope in front of you. Not just any hope, but this miraculous hope that it's blessed, that it's literally of God, that it's something supernatural that's in front of you that every single day you wake up and you think today could be the day. Jesus is coming soon. Today could be the day. Jesus is coming soon. Jesus, let it be today. 